Hi, welcome to this introduction to environmental management systems aligned to ISO 14001 2015. My name is Chris from FQM and we'd like to take this chance to ask you to subscribe to our YouTube channel and also follow us on LinkedIn. And don't forget to access our free resources area within our website. So European public authorities spend approximately 1.8 trillion euros on goods and services which is about 14% of the GDP, directing this spending power towards the purchase of greener products and services with lesser impact to the environment would have a huge direct environmental benefit. It would help drive the market in the use of more efficient products uh, and result in a considerable cost saving if done effectively. And it would set an example for corporate and private consumers. So I'll give you an example of that. So the EU public authorities buy approximately 2.8 million computers annually. Uh, this is a 2019 data. That's compared to about 280 million globally, uh, which are sold computers which are sold globally. So this 2.8 million is approximately 10% of the European computer market. If European market could be moved to producing slightly more efficient computers, then over 8 million tonnes of CO2 could be saved, equivalent to the emissions of almost a million people throughout a whole year. So if we could all make a difference by one small step at a time. OK, so what is ISO 14001? So it's an international standard for the requirements of an environmental management system. It's produced by the International Organization for Standardization in Switzerland. It's been adopted by more than 300,000 companies globally, and it's used as a basis for third party and accredited certification against your environmental management practices. So when we talk about environmental management system or an EMS, what do we mean by that? So it's part of an, uh, an organization's management system used to develop and implement its environmental policies and manage its environmental aspects. That's a key area. And when you hear me talking about aspects and impacts, we effectively are meaning hazards and risks. It's just the terminology that's used in the environmental world. So. An EMS is a demonstrable system to direct and control an organization with regards to the environment. So understanding what your needs and expectations are by an organization and demonstrating that. What your company does to minimize the harmful effects on the environment caused by the activities that your organization undertake. And this includes also down through the supply chain and other subcontracts or partners that you might work with. Of course, it's got to be able to demonstrate compliance, which is to conform to applicable regulatory and legal requirements. You want to reduce and manage your environmental risks as much as you can. And we'll go into that in a lot more detail. And it's to drive continual improvement in your environmental performance. So first thing to mention about 14,001 and really the majority of the ISO uh, certification standards, these are what's classed as generic standards. So they can be applied to any organization of any size, whether they are manufacturing, distributing, a service organization, and in any sector at all. You can be a private business, or you could be a government organization, it doesn't really matter. The genetic standard is written in such a way it tells you what the requirements are, but does not tell you how you apply your business practices to meet those requirements. This is because every organization is a little bit different, and in some way it must interpret how you meet those requirements of the standards yourself. Of course, your risks your uh, environmental aspects and impacts are going to be different depending on the organization. So therefore, the generic standard is built around what's expected of you, but you have to identify how you apply them based on these aspects and impacts. And there's much more flexibility in the 2015 version of the standard. There's a decrease, decreased emphasis on documentation, which is good. There's an increased emphasis on achieving value 
for the organisation and its customers, and as an increased emphasis on risk management to achieve your objectives. So let me just pause for one second, guys. There's a few more people joining. So the origin, ISO 14001 was developed in response to environmental problems that the world faced today. It was first published in 1996, and the latest version came out in 2015 in September. It takes a basis from what was first developed and enhanced in 2004, but it provides a much greater emphasis on risk and what's classed as a process approach. And like the origin of a, a number of the newer ISO standards, it uses something called Annex SL as its platform and how it was created. And this allows for a much greater ability to integrate the, your environmental management system with, for example, your health and safety management system to ISO 45001 or your quality management system to ISO 9001. It a, has a high level structure, as we said, which follows the Annex XL. And its ability there is to enhance the consistency and alignment with these different standards. OK, so if you have uh, systems to meet the requirements of these other standards, then it's strongly suggested that you integrate them and operate them together because there are many elements of them where the requirements are identical or very similar. So as of December 2018, more than 20,000 companies in the UK had been certified to ISO 14001 with companies in over 100 and 38 countries having 400,000 certificates, taking up certification, and many more that follow the requirements, but do not go down the, the certification route. This standard itself, uh, because of the, the emphasis on environmental awareness globally now, uh, and we see it regularly in the press and social media, we can see this uh, requirement growing at 10% year on year, and this we expect to continue for quite some time. So what are the benefits of an environmental management system? So you want to improve your management of your environmental impacts, the impacts that your organization, the people working within it and the equipment you use on the environment. You want to set targets to reduce your energy use, your water use, your waste that goes to landfill. And you want to initiate and maintain procedures to improve your efficiencies. So if you use a quality approach to drive continual improvement, then you can take a, a bench level uh, understanding of what your energy use, water use, and waste to landfill is, and you can drive improvement programs to be in that place where you're driving maybe 10% or 5% improvement year on year. Ideally, what it does is gives you a focus to, to use less evasive chemicals as well that will not be harmful to the environment. Take a risk management approach to environmental incidents. So understand where your risks are and the potential for incidents and put a proactive approach in place and how they will be managed. They want you to work with contractors to ensure your expectations are driven down through your supply chain. If you heavily use subcontractors or contractors within your organization, uh, whether that be working alongside you, supplying you with products, or you subcontract services to them, then it's possible that the greatest weakness in your environmental impact may be your subcontractors and contractors. And therefore, once you have a mature system in place, you want to pass that requirement down through your supply chain. And of course, maybe using preferred business travel options is another thing that we could benefit from this. Uh, more people working from home, more people undertaking video conferencing, et cetera, et cetera. Key elements here as well is about identifying the key responsibilities for achieving your targets. You know, the days are gone of having an environmental management system that was a responsibility of the environmental advisor that sat in a folder on a shelf and was reviewed a couple of times a year when an auditor came to town. That's not what these systems are about now. They're about passing responsibility all through the organization so that across the business, you can try and achieve these targets. 
By doing that, you can promote a culture of environmental awareness among all your staff and contractors to encourage a good adoption of the system, but also gain knowledge on improvement areas, because often the people that are undertaking the work and undertaking the tasks, they can provide you with some of the additional improvement areas that may be achievable. The benefits also are about monitoring and measuring your environmental performance against key indicators. You have to have targets in place and you have to have a bench line that you try and achieve beyond that. And of course, you must regularly assess your progress to, to, towards achieving those targets. Of course, there are environmental legal requirements that all organizations must comply with. Depending upon your business, some of them may be very small level in terms of your energy use and your waste, whereas others may be in the petrochemical industry, for example, or, or organizations that handle waste, your legal requirements will be far greater. That's the reason why I mentioned that this is a generic standard and it must be built around your legal and risks associated to your business. It may have assist you with environmental reporting. So there may be environmental reporting that you have to, to give to authorities. And of course, there are government policy which are communicated out to industry and communities. One of the key things that we would say to many organizations that kind of look at environmental management and see it as a, a cost to their business, a properly implemented environmental management system should actually achieve cost savings. Rather than driving many things to waste, it gives you the ability to recycle and reuse. And there's a few examples I'll talk about later uh, of how that can happen. So there are various interactions of an EMS system and it's important to understand the structure and how they come together. There's the termination of your significant environmental aspects. So as I mentioned, every organization is different. So each company has to determine what their environmental aspects are. And of course, there's a requirement aligned to that with your legal and other requirements. So these may be industry guidelines, industry requirements, legal obligations, or even contract obligations driven down from your contract, your framework, or your customer. And these should drive you to implement an environmental policy to set the scene on what's expected of your organization. And from that policy should come your objectives and targets. You will have a, a, a operational control in which your operations should be able to demonstrate control over your environmental actions. You will also potentially have a number of programs and plans in place, possibly change management and development. These should be monitored and measured on a regular basis to see how well you're performing. And of course, all organizations who implement an environmental management system must be able to demonstrate that they have emergency preparedness and response in place. What do we mean by that? Effectively, this means your plans in place where there is an environmental emergency so that you can demonstrate and test these plans to ensure that when there is an emergency, if there is, you have the capability to put it in place. And based on these monitoring and measuring activities, we want to drive improvement. And this is driven through our corrective and preventative actions. And of course, part of that comes from our ongoing auditing and evaluation of compliance that we have in place. There's a whole bunch of supporting activities that are required to ensure that an environmental management system works, because importantly, for any of these systems to work effectively, they have to be implemented well across the business. So there has to be good communication throughout an organization on why this system is in place. And you have to be able to ensure that you uh, communicate and make people aware of their implication on the system in a positive way and in a negative way if they do something wrong. You have to ensure that you've got competence and training and awareness throughout the business, the people that understand their requirements. And of course, there has to be allocation of resources, document control, your record control, et cetera, et cetera. 
So management, as you can imagine, play a key part in these systems. If you don't have effective management driving this from the top down, you're going to have quite a weak, uh, unstable system in the first place. So management should be looking to develop and approve the policy statement that they want to commit to throughout the organisation. They want to commit to the resources and the investments that may be required for training and maybe external support. And they need to, need to also take responsibility to ensure that the EMS is established and implemented throughout the business and that they are driving improvement. So this comes from maybe management interacting much more with the business, with the people on the shop floor, with the guys using the tools so that they understand and get feedback and liaise with them. And they should be a constant advocate of the EMS, you know, what its benefits are and provide regular communication and engagement. So this may, doesn't necessarily have to be meetings. This can be just being seen to be out there, maybe putting charts up and reporting on positives that have came out from the environmental management system. And they want to also uh, give the necessary support to overcome any barriers. So where there are barriers, i.e. people that do not want or do not see the benefits in this, and there always will be people that don't see the benefits of this and it's not my job, then management need to provide the support down through the organisation to try and overcome these barriers. They need to use a methodology of how they can convince individuals that this is going to work. And of course, there might be at some point in time disciplinary action, but ideally they want to drive this through engagement and communication. So typically there's a high level structure associated or a top level structure associated to your 14,001. And really what that's looking at is what you do after you've set your policy and planning to achieve your objectives associated to that. These have to be implemented all the way down through your organisation, all through your operational activities, and they have to be regularly checked. They have to be checked regularly to see that you are meeting those objectives and that no additional risks or harm to the environment is being implemented for different activities that you're involved in. And part of that checking and monitoring process is that it should be uh, passed up through into a management review structure that then should get commitment to drive improvement. These systems are all about improvement. They're not about just set in stone systems that are dormant. This is the way we always work. Nothing changes. Everything changes within business. Regularly things happen uh, in an emergency situation or a last minute situation or a new type of contract or award comes in or a new type of supplied material needs to be used in your manufacturing facility. So there are always changes and with change, there's the ability to drive improvement. We like to refer to the method of how these uh, areas of improvement can come from using what we call PDCA, Plan, Do, Check, Act. Now this comes back way back into uh, the sort of 60s period with uh, Tokyo uh, and the Toyota Motor Company. Um, PDCA is a very simple, very fundamental way of explaining how you can continually improve operations within your business. This methodology can be used in a single area within your business or all across your business. Effectively, what we're looking at is we're looking at planning what it is that we are trying to do, whether that be just a straightforward business activity or something new that's coming in. And when we plan to do these activities, we have to understand as part of our planning what the needs and expectations are of our interested parties. And we mean from that our suppliers, our legal requirements, our contractual customer requirements. And of course, we must understand any internal or external issues associated to our business operations. These could be things that are uh, dictated to us from the Environmental Agency or SEPA, or they may be very much associated to the industry or the local authority requirements that we, we work in. 
So when we plan what we're going to do, we need to understand what these activities are and expectations on us. And of course, with that, we have to put in the necessary support in order to achieve what we want to achieve. So these are the people, these are the equipment, the tools, the supply chain in order for us to achieve what we're planning to achieve. And obviously these are driven down into our operational activities, which is whatever it is within our organization that we undertake to sell our services, sell our products. And based on these activities, what we were planning to achieve, we want to know if we have achieved it. So this is why we have what's called performance evaluation. This is the checking part, okay? So the, 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 the C of the PDCA. So let's check that what we plan to do, we have actually done within our support and operations. And then based on the checking that we've done, let's act on that. Where there is room for improvement, where we've identified error, where we've identified good activity, let's act on it and let's drive improvement. And therefore, when we get round to the next planning phase, we see that we have taken improvement areas to drive improvement back through the business. So determine the scope of the system during the initial phase, which will continually develop throughout the life cycle of your EMS. We want to do what we want to do, so develop appropriate documentation, assign responsibilities in order to ensure that the relevant issues are managed effectively. And you have to have a period of monitoring and checking to ensure the system is working efficiently and effectively to meet those requirements. And we want to take appropriate measures to rectify any shortfalls and updating where the circumstances change or incidents or findings need actions to be taken on them. So there are a number of key elements that's absolutely required within an EMS. Um, and that is that you must have a policy statement that sits high up and be committed to from senior management. You must identify your significant environmental aspects. And as I said before, your environmental aspects is effectively the hazards, environmental hazards. It's the terminology that's used in the environmental world. And you want to develop your objectives and targets. What are you actually trying to do with this environmental management system? If all you're trying to do is achieve certification, then actually your level of expectation is quite low because achieving certification is actually quite simple to achieve. But if you're investing time and effort into your environmental management system, why not get something in return? Get a return on investment, not just a certificate. So develop objectives and targets to try and drive change, try and drive improvement. Implementation plan to meet those objectives and targets. Train and develop competence within your organization, whether that's through awareness and communication or coaching. And you must have a commitment of management reviewing how well your performance is and how well you're achieving, and of course, driving improvement from that. So let me jump into the elements of 14,001 in a little bit more detail, okay? So these are referred to as clauses within the standard. So clause three just refers to terms and definitions. So if you're unfamiliar with the standard itself, then it's worthwhile reading up clause three because it will give you the terms and definitions and you'll be able to see how they will relate to your business. Clause four is the context of the organization and it's really understanding what it is your organization's about and understanding what the needs and expectations are from your interested parties in association to environmental aspects and impacts. And of course, developing what your environmental management system will look like. Clause five looks for leadership commitment. So this is how the leadership will show their commitment by putting their policy in place, by showing their commitment through adopting organizational roles, responsibilities and authorities. And of course, what we mean by that is not necessarily that they are appointing or hiring 
an environmental advisor. It could be that they are giving these roles and responsibilities to others in the organisation that want to commit and work with the business to achieve this environmental improvement. Then you've got clause six, which is your planning activities. So this is the actions that you take to address your organization's risks and opportunities. So what are your environmental aspects? Looking down through your supply chain in terms of services and products you receive, looking inside your organization about the efficiencies that you have in your business, the energy that you use, the fuel that's consumed, looking at ways and means of maybe doing things a little bit more efficiently, using greener products. So understanding your environmental aspects is the first area around the planning. And of course, you have compliance obligations, so you need to understand what your legal requirements are. And again, there are a host of legal requirements that we simply as organisations working in the UK, in the EU, we must comply with. But some of those requirements will be very minimal to certain organisations compared to others. So if you're an office based environment, then your requirements around environmental management will be much less in terms of if you were a manufacturing organisation or even a service organisation that generates significant waste. Under planning, we must plan how we are going to achieve those compliance obligations. And we must set ourselves objectives through planning. We must set ourselves what we want to try and achieve based on what our environmental performance is. So we want to try and plan on how we are going to achieve those environmental objectives. Clause 7 is all about support. So what do we need in our organisation to ensure that we can function correctly and ensure that we can develop those planning elements around our environmental management system? So, of course, we need resources. We need equipment. We need our people. We need vehicles. We need tools. We may even need people in our supply chain to assist us in how we are going to achieve our environmental planning activities. We need competence within our business or we need to hire competence in as appropriate. We need awareness within our business so that people understand what it is that we are trying to achieve. We need to have good communication. We need to be able to communicate well within our organization but of course, we have to consider what communication we have to give externally. It may be that we have to report on certain environmental performance to the EA or SEPA. It may be that we have to provide and get certificates of meeting certain requirements from our local authority. And of course, part of the support area in Clause 7 is our documented management system. It's required as part of the system to support how we achieve what it is we're trying to achieve. So we've got our general EMS system that's put in place. We've got any new documents that need to be created and documents that need to be updated where we see improvement. And we have to have a structure around how that works. Generally speaking, people that have already, let's say a 9001 quality management system, this will be a fundamental part of their system and therefore there's not a lot of activity required here. You just have to ensure that the good practices you use around quality management is adopted in your environmental system as well. And then of course in clause eight is your operations, the things that you actually do. So it's the planning and control of the products you produce, the services you provide, and of course, not forgetting, we must have in place emergency preparedness and response. Now, a little bit like looking at the environmental aspects and impacts and risks within your business, your organization's environmental emergency preparedness may be quite low. It may be that you are in an office building and your significant 
emergency preparedness is much more associated to fire, for example, um, rather than environmental emergency impact. But if you're an organisation where uh, actually you are having a greater impact on the environment, then there is a strong possibility that something could go wrong. So it's understanding those emergency situations, if they could occur, how you will prepare and respond to them. And then, of course, number nine is your performance evaluation. So remember back, we were planning to achieve objectives in Clause 6, and we had our support from management. We also had our structure and our resources in place and how we were going to do that. This is where we take these measurements. So we want to monitor, measure, analyze, and evaluate our performance. It's not just a case of monitoring and measuring. Are we doing what we said we were doing? But we want to analyze and evaluate the information. This is a little bit like if you refer to near misses associated to health and safety. If you analyze and evaluate that data well, often it can give you indicators of where there are weaknesses. And this is similar to the environmental management system. Where you have potential weaknesses that come up to you from your monitoring and measurement, analyzing and evaluating, then you can look to drive improvement based on these potential weaknesses. As well as your performance evaluation associated to your general environmental management system, we have to also be able to understand how you evaluate your compliance to your environmental legal requirements. So there are a number of these things in place and depending again upon the structure of your business and the services and products that you provide, then your compliance requirements, which have been identified already in clause six, you have to evaluate, are you meeting those compliance requirements? Are you achieving them? And how is it you are achieving them? And part of that may be driven through your internal audit program, where you have a product program that looks at your obligations, your objectives, your operational activities, looking at your management of your aspects and impacts, but also looking at your legal compliance requirements. At the end of clause nine is really about the management review. So it's based on the performance evaluation activities that you've done and really escalating that up to management to show them how well the organization has performed or how well it has not performed. And ideally looking at areas where you could improve more. So that then pushes us on to the last section, the last clause, which is clause 10, which is your improvement. So generally just looking for improvements throughout the organization or actually driving improvements where non-conformities have occurred or significant risk has came about. So where there have been issues, where there have been spills, where there have been significant waste or environmental impact, what have we done to address that? And importantly, have we put effective corrective actions in place? And of course, as any good improvement system, there should also be a drive for continual improvement. This may be around uh, observation systems, observation cards, where people can report and, uh, and potentially bring to the table potential other improvements that may not be getting discussed at that time. So when we get into the policy statement itself, there, this is really the management's declaration of commitment to the environment. So what is it they're trying to do? So they have to be able to demonstrate that they commit to their compliance requirements. They have to be able to commit that they prevent, commit to a prevention of pollution and incidents and commit to a continual improvement program. They are the three big main elements of a 14,001 environmental management system. There has to be a broader definition around pollution prevention as well. And often this is only required where the organization is a business that actually creates a potential level of pollution. And it must be appropriate to the nature, the scale, 
of the business and its impacts. And it should provide a framework, ideally to set objectives and a way of setting a mission and requirement throughout the organisation. One of the key factors of any management system is communication. Okay, so if you do not have good communication throughout a business, then your drive towards any type of implementation of a management system and what you want to achieve from it is going to be extremely difficult. So we spoke before, you heard me mention the term aspects and impacts. OK, so when we talk about an organization's significant aspects, OK, and these can be non-regulated aspects, so these don't have to be things that are related to the law. And they can maybe be positive or negative, OK? So when we think about an aspect, we have to think about the cause or the input. So this is the element of an organization's activities, products or services, which can interact with the environment. So this can be simply just using vehicles, using energy consumption. You know, this can be keeping lights on, when the office is closed or the business is not operating. So this is the aspect, so it's the cause or input, so what it is that we're doing. So for example, if you use leaving the lights on in the office, then the impact of that is what effect it may have. So any change to the environment, well, of course, we're using additional resources as a result of that. If that aspect is maybe related to waste, then it may be that the impact on the environment is the type of waste, could be hazardous waste or non-hazardous. So it's the, it, it, it's, could we change the aspect so that the impact could improve? So that's the key elements here about when I refer to this as like hazard and risk from a health and safety point of view, we look to try and change the hazard or control the hazard in a better way so that we have a, a lesser impact of risk. This is the same with aspects and impacts. What it is that we can do associated to the cause or input of what we do so that we can lessen the effect or the output. So could we reduce our waste? OK, so I'll give you an example of that, a very simple one from a small organization that we worked with a number of years ago. They were simply a, a distributor of electrical products. So they purchased large volumes of ele small electrical products like fuses and things like that. They received these in large bulk order and they came in large cardboard boxes. They were a reasonably successful organization, so they had these you know, deliveries coming in regularly. They would then take these large orders and distribute them in smaller orders to their customers that, that purchased from them. What they found that they had was that they had a, quite a significant cost associated to recycling um, their cardboard that came in from the large deliveries. And one of the, the warehouse operatives, just a guy that drives a forklift, packs boxes, came up with a good suggestion, which was to uh, purchase or make a, basically a high level industrial shredder. Because what he recognized was that not only was the company spending significant money on the recycling of their cardboard, they also spent quite a bit of time, uh, quite a bit of money, sorry, buying packaging material for the smaller packaging that they sent. So effectively, they were buying these uh, polystyrene or air pockets um, used in every box. So when they looked at the costs associated to that, between the waste management costs and the management of the packaging material, they were spending something in the region of 25 to 35,000 pounds a year on that. This guy developed a, an improvement program where they brought in an industrial shredder. I think it cost them about 5K. 
And basically what they did was they shredded all of their boxes. And this industrial shredder uh, had a force of air going through it as well. So as it shred the cardboard, it forced air through it and separated out the cardboard or paper leaves and basically produced their own packaging material. Um, the result of that was that there was slightly increased amount of time to do it, um, but they made processes to simplify that as well. But effectively what they did was they reduced their impact on the environment by reusing the material. They reduced their impact on the environment by not having to purchase packaging material. And effectively what they did, they saved themselves some money in the long run. I think ultimately they got a 50% cost saving. So there are ways and means within any type of organization to look at what your aspect is and what that impact is. So we must consider our aspects and impacts associated to air emissions, waste, water, any type of contamination to land. We must also remember that noise, vibration and odour can come into this as well. So where we are extracting, uh, you know, an odour or some smoke or something, chemical fumes out into the environment. Our land use, our energy use, our water use, what raw material and resources we use. And also we should consider our positive environmental issues as well. So an example here is another one that you can look at as well. So when we look at ranking of aspects, what we have to think about here is a little bit similar and we can use a similar methodology to our health and safety hazards and risks. So we want to look at determining our significant environmental aspects and we have to think about the significance, the scoring methodology that we use. So we want to consider our environmental concerns around regulatory and legal exposure, health and environmental exposure, risks, and also conservation, depending upon the locations that we work. We have to think about the effect on the public image as well, and any community concerns in the locations where we're working. You know, if you were, in your street at home, if a new building site came up and suddenly you seen things coming out of that building site that you weren't sure of what they were, chemicals or something or some sort of liquid flowing out on a continuous basis, that company was not containing their impact on the environment. You wouldn't be too happy about that. You'd be raising concerns. You'd have community concerns, maybe other children playing about. So. We have to think about that. We also must think about cost savings and how our cost savings can be recovered maybe over a period of time. And when we think about our aspects and impacts, we must think also about scale. Are we driving an improvement in our business where we're going through a growth spurt? So what impact this would have? And we also must think about a little bit like health and safety risk assessment, we must think about the probability of the occurrence of these things happening. So what's the fre frequency and the likelihood of these things happening? And of course, what the severity of the impact would be. So you would drive your controls around the items which have the highest severity and the greater probability of happening. So there are a number of areas around aspects and impacts I've mentioned that we have to consider. Many of these driven from legal requirements associated to the land, to food, to water, to our resources. And of course, we are having an impact on these through uh, global temperature changes, sea levels changes, ice caps melting, etc. So we have to think about this in a larger global scale. And as I said right from the very beginning, one small step for each individual can have a greater impact overall in the world. So our legal and other requirements. So this is setting our legal framework. We need to have a process in place where we identify and have access to what our legal requirements are. And we must have a documented system that demonstrates that we're keeping up to date with that. 
So there are a number of free areas uh, on the web where we can access that information for free, but we have to be able to understand and decipher how it applies to our business. And importantly, if it applies to our business, and there must be a method of if it does apply, how do we communicate and put the practices in place associated to that? So as part of our planning, we're establishing our objectives and targets based on what our policy has identified, based on what our risks associated to our aspects and impacts are, and based on our legal and other requirements. And the other, again, remember, is a general term which could be associated to the locations that we work in, the contracts that we follow, or our customer demands. So what do we, when we talk about objectives and targets, what is it we try to do? Well, do we want to try and reduce our waste, like what I mentioned before? And as a result of reducing the waste, it could be that we get financial benefit as well. Do we want to reduce or eliminate the release of pollution from our business? Do we want to design products where they have a greater minimal impact on the environment when they're used? maybe more efficient products? What about the efficiency and operations of our systems? Is there ways and means that we can switch things off or turn things off when they're not always being used? Is there a way of them automatically going into a standby, more efficient way of operating when they're not always in use? So we have to be realistic of what our objectives are, keep them simple, keep them flexible, but importantly, they have to be measurable and achievable, okay? We don't want to be setting ourselves objectives which are airy-fairy, one-liners that sound good. We want to be actually driving something that's going to have an, a benefit to our business and an, a benefit to the environment. So it could be that our objective is reduce electricity use in the office. OK, so our target is to reduce electricity use by 15 percent year on year uh, by introducing a policy of turning off all computer monitors, install energy efficient light bulbs, install heat exchange pumps. Or we could have an objective which is to reduce company fuel use. And that target is to reduce the fuel use by 20 percent year on year by reducing the amount of business travel by five to 10 percent and increase the use of web or televideo based meetings um, and maybe by using contractors with fuel efficient plant and equipment as well. So when we think about this, we think, well, do this, do this exercise yourself in your own business. What things would you like to see an improvement on? And remember, these types of targets are going to reduce your impact on the environment but also are going to see you having a cost saving in your organization. So immediately you start to see that having a good environmental management system that works for your business can save you money. And of course, what we want to do is we don't want to just set these targets and plans, but we want to set an action plan, how we're going to do it, who's going to be involved, what investment of time is required to achieve this? Do we have to uh, purchase something to allow us to be able to do it, buy something different, replace something? And often we can think about using these targets and objectives. We often refer to using a traffic light system to see how well we're how well we're doing in those plans. And remember, objectives and plans is it doesn't have to be something you're planning to achieve within six months or a month or even a year. These can be things that you want to try and achieve over, say, a three, five year cycle. But that plan will be able to demonstrate how you achieve that, the steps you take to achieve that. So we've got lots of information here about the terms and definitions and the details and a bit more that you can refer to in these slides and also in the international standard itself. So some terms and definitions, if you have a 9001 management system or a 45001 health and safety management system, you may be familiar with many of these terms, but if not, 
this is uh, a way of you being able to find this out. So context, remember, of your organization is about your business. So it's understanding what the needs and expectations are of your organization and the interested parties associated to your organization. OK, so it's not about putting a management system in place. That's a copy from someone else's management system. It's not about putting a management system in place just so it looks like you're ticking some boxes. It's about having a management system in that's related to the expectations of your internal and external issues. OK, your leadership commitment is that if you don't have strong leadership commitment to an environmental management system, then you're off to a very poor start. These systems have to be driven from top, from top down. OK, they must be demonstrated to be led from the top. So we must see commitment from our leadership. And remember, when we refer to leadership, we don't necessarily just mean a board of directors. We mean just people within the organization that demonstrate these leadership skills that maybe show leadership as a supervisor on the production line. They show leadership to the guys that work alongside them or maybe someone that's a contracts manager that works on a, a construction site, for example, their leadership skills and how they communicate and how they demonstrate to the guys working on the site why the environmental management system is important. So it's important to recognize that an organization shouldn't now just delegate every piece of responsibility associated to an environmental management system down through the business. There has to be leadership commitment. And that commitment starts with the policy and the commitment through the roles, responsibilities and authorities. And just re-emphasizing on the planning, the planning is about identifying and addressing our risks and opportunities. And this is based on our environmental aspects. OK, and of course, the aspects that have the greatest impact on the environment. Likewise, we have to understand our legal compliance obligations or our local compliance obligations. And we want to be setting our objectives and how we are going to achieve them. So what is it we want to achieve from an environmental point of view? And is it possible by doing this, we can save money? We can be more efficient. Therefore, uh, it may also help towards our quality management objectives. It's possible that improved environmental objectives may also bring about improved health and safety for our workers. So maybe using less evasive chemicals um, by replacing chemicals that may be quite harmful to the environment may also be less harmful to our employees. And of course, the support, like I said before, we have to have our resources in place around this. We have to have competence within our organization and we have to importantly have awareness built into the system. We have to ensure that people know what it is that they are responsible for doing and why they're doing it. OK, we need to know that they understand the implications of not meeting or not undertaking certain requirements and what that impact may have on the environment and on the business. I like to use a term, uh, people only know what they know unless you tell them what you want them to know. If people are not made aware of the environmental management system and just see this as some sort of thing that we do to achieve a certificate, they won't really buy into it. They won't get what it's for. But if you use examples and you drive that awareness in the business, and importantly, if you set objectives, drive those objectives down through the organization. OK, ensure that people understand how they are playing a part to meet those objectives. So good communication internally and also externally where required to our supply chain. And of course, we must have our documented structure around how that is done and we must be able to demonstrate that we are updating and managing our documents appropriately. 
our operational planning and control. So there's nothing to say uh, from, an, uh, from an environmental management system that you have to change anything that you're doing in your operations. You may have very efficient and very effective systems. What we're asking you to do is look at these operations to see where there are areas that have the greatest potential impact on the environment. So looking at your operational planning and control methodology, is there anything within your business which has a potential high impact in the environment? Maybe not in normal operations, but it may be in abnormal operations we have to consider this. And when we mean abnormal operations, we mean things that we don't do very often. We may have our sites that are shut down for maintenance once a year. What happens in those situations? Is there something strange that occurs, something different where our impact on the environment could be greater? And we must also recognise in emergency situations, what could our impact be? Okay, So if we shut something down or if something goes on fire or an extreme situation where we have to close down our operations because of being driven by, for example, a government lockdown situation. What impact does that have on our business and what impact does it have on the environment, particularly when it comes back to starting it back up again? And our performance evaluation is based on what it is we are trying to achieve have we achieved what we set out? Have we achieved our targets? And remember, those targets may be small in gen general over a long period of time. And our evaluation of are we complying with our legal obligations? And much of that performance evaluation comes down to how we internally audit our business. And actually, you know, I've done quite a number of free training webinars on internal auditing, which you'll find on our YouTube channel um, and also blogs on our, our website. It's really important to recognise that you want to get return on investment also from your internal audit programme. So we suggest that you use a risk based internal audit process. So you set a programme of auditing your system based on the greatest impact to the environment. So focus your areas of attention in the areas which either you are trying to drive to improve something, to achieve greater target, or areas that have the most weakness, where it's possible that uh, if something's not controlled well, if there is a release, if there is a mistake, then the impact on the environment is going to be greater. So therefore, the level of control required needs to be greater as well. And of course, the improvement area. You know, there's no point having these systems in place where you are driving and setting objectives, where you're getting everyone on board to go in the same direction, where you are monitoring, measuring and analysing the data. If you don't do anything with it, then effectively you don't have a true PDCA improvement program. And I, always, I would always say the drive for improvement is one of the greatest areas of any environmental or any management system, to be honest. So it's about really driving that improvement home based on the data that you have analysed before. It's based on where you've had issues non-conformities, uh, emergency situations where you've had to put corrective actions in place, or it could be driven by a continual improvement program through observations and different information that's provided to you. So you have to establish and maintain documents, processes and procedures that demonstrate how you monitor and measure the key characteristics of your operations associated to your significant impacts on the environment. Now, of course, as I said before, you may not have in your operations significant impact on the environment if, for example, you're an office organisation. But if you are an organisation that potentially does have significant impact on the environment or could have if there was an incident, therefore you need to be able to demonstrate that you have the necessary safe working practices in place, showing environmental planning 
documentation and how you monitor and measure these key characteristics. And you must be able to demonstrate that you can track how well the system is working and measure the characteristics and show evidence associated to that of how you have these in control. And where appropriate, you must be able to analyze root causes of problems that have occurred, leaks or significant uh, impacts that you've had, not just containing them, but actually showing that you've taken an investigative approach to identify the root causes of these issues. And your evaluation of compliance is develop a process or procedure for periodically evaluating what your legal obligations are and if there have been any changes in these legal obligations. And you must keep records as part of the environmental system to show the method and how you have gone about evaluating this. And of course, part of this can be done, particularly the compliance section within your internal audit system. You must have a process or procedure that demonstrates how you investigate, contain, correct and prevent deficiencies within your system through a non-conformity and corrective action system. So you want to set up your processes for assigning responsibilities of who would take accountability for doing these investigations, for putting these containment plans in place, and importantly, for looking at long-term corrective actions. And these have to be processes that are revised as part of the EMS, but remember, they can be integrated with your health and safety and your quality management system as part of your non-conformance and corrective action system. Control of records is important as well, particularly if you're using your EMS to go for a certification. So you must be able to demonstrate that how you have these records in place and that you have control over them. Now, when I talk about records, I don't necessarily mean bits of paper. There are obviously lots of electronic tools out there now that allow us to record information electronically and keep data associated to our management systems, including audits, training records, management reviews, uh, monitoring and measurement and analysis results, various different ways of doing it. Um, but we have to be able to show that we've got control over that. And then as part of our internal audit, we have to be able to show that we've got a program in place. And if you have an integrated system, it's good to show the elements of what parts of the systems that each of the scopes of the audits are undertaking and be able to demonstrate the method of how you're doing the auditing, who's going to be doing the audits, and of course, ideally you're looking to try and get some level of impartiality where possible. So again, we've got uh, a number of free webinars that talk about how you develop an audit program. And I'd suggest you maybe hop onto YouTube or LinkedIn and you'll get a bit more information on how we suggest you do that. We've got some free samples in there of how you can develop uh, an audit schedule over a three year plan as well. Management review, again, this is really about showing that management have given commitment right at the start of the journey here. They've committed to putting this in place and continually driving to improve. So the management review activity as part of our clause nine is that we are now taking the information that they started with and driving that back to them to say, here is how we've achieved, here is what we set out to do, and this is what we've achieved. And importantly, we want to be able to show that we are uh, escalating and concluding anything associated to any emergency, any major non-conformance, or any significant change which has had an impact on the environment. This is where we can show that we have documented this formally and that the actions have either been taken or planned to be taken. Remember, all the way through this, I've spoke about possibility of integrating. There are a number of overlapping requirements as part of 9001 
and also as part of 45001. Those are the quality management system standards and the health and safety management system standards. And some of the key areas there that are pretty much overlapping, almost identical, is the methods and how you control your documents and records, how you plan and perform your auditing, your management review process, your corrective and preventive actions, and how you put in place your competence, training, awareness, and driving through improvement through your business. All of these elements are within all three of the standards. When it comes to auditing itself, we always refer back to the general principles of auditing guidelines, which is an ISO 19011 document. And we suggest anyone, whether it's related to EMS or QMS or health and safety management system, refer to this document. It's free to download on the internet and it gives you some good guiding principles around the methods of internal auditing. So let's just drill down a little bit in more detail about legislation. So when we talk about legislation, depending upon the organisation you work in and the industry you work in, these can be international requirements that you must comply with. They may be national legislation that's put in place, or they can be local regulations associated to the, the, the town or the county or the country that you're working in. So these can be acts and regulations or local bylaws, and they may be also associated to town and country planning requirements in terms of how you use the land, how you use the land and the impact you may have on that land in other areas as well, uh, for example, associated to animals or fisheries. So town and country regulations require developers or major projects to produce an environmental statement, a detailed environmental uh, EIA it's referred to, which shows the activity that they're going to be doing on that land, what impact it would have on the environment. We must also look at our air pollution, okay? So this is the atmospheric emissions. So are we an organization that can be driving increased air pollution through our atmospheric emissions? And we can have different filter systems and different methods of how we can ensure that we control that. But of course, it's down to the business that we operate in and how we are demonstrating that. And we must remember that there's a continual drive to improve our air pollution. So therefore, these legislative requirements are changing regularly and putting more requirements on business operations. And effluent and water. So there's a number of legislation control around the discharge of water and whether there's a requirement to the consent, depending upon what is in the water. So there is a number of acts and requirements associated to this, and there's different consent levels, which we must follow associated to this as well. And again, this is going to be based on your business, based on your organization, and based on what byproducts that you may pass out through the normal sewage or waste control system. We also have to think about waste. So most organizations have some form of waste. Now, more often than not, this waste is non-hazardous waste uh, and it just gets handled through normal waste collection methodology. But an organisation must have a duty of care associated to this waste, especially when it's special hazardous or controlled waste that cannot just straightforward go to a landfill. We must be able to demonstrate that under these control methodologies and legislation, that we're taking the appropriate actions, hiring the appropriate contractors to handle the material, and of course, keeping records of how we pass that and that material from us to another, where it's a, a legal change of ownership. And the companies that we use to do this have to be able to demonstrate to us that they take responsible measures as well. A whole bunch of other legislation but, and there's nothing within these slides that's going to tell you exactly what you have to do as a business. You have to understand what legislation around environmental management 
complies to your business. There are, of course, a whole bunch of EU legislation that we must follow uh, that, of course, could quite rightly be changing. Um, but there are also other places, uh, specifically other laws, sorry, specifically to our own uh, four regions in England, Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland. So when we think about our legislation, we must then think about based on that legislation, what do we have to do? Not just that, yes, that's a legislation we must comply with, that's fine, tick a box. What is it we have to do as part of that legislation or legal requirement? So there are compliance requirements built into that, and we have to make sure that we're regularly reviewing it and making sure we comply with it. So our documentation is important for this, okay? It provides a signposting to the different components of our system. And if we are using it for certification, we must demonstrate how our documentation complies to the clauses of the standard. And this is where an external auditor will come and look to review the requirements of the clauses of the standard against your system, against your practices, and against your records, okay? There are a whole bunch of system documentation that's required within the systems, but will be dependent upon the activities you're involved in, okay? Um, there are different ways of how you control your documentation, um, methods on how this information is shared, and appropriately how you control changes. Like any management system, we have to be able to show a structure of document control and the method and how we do that. OK, so this can be done simply through one person controlling it like a document control person, or it could also be done through an electronic system uh, that has a, a document or electronic document control built into it. Part of the documents that we would start to create when we develop a new system would be maybe our initial review or gap analysis that we do. So this would be taking our existing practices versus the requirements of the standard. Often organizations start with a manual, which gives guidance around the overall structure of the system and how it meets the requirements of the standard. And then based on that, they would build their own specific procedures or processes in how they operate specific to their business. And of course, there's going to be a bunch of registers that support that in terms of uh, aspects or impacts or legal requirements or improvement activities or non-conformances and so on and so forth. Document structures can look in various ways. This is just one example of a method of a document structure that you would want to start putting in place. So we think about, as I mentioned, the preliminary uh, environmental review, which is basically gathering information effectively. And then it's building the, the basic environmental system, which often would be placed within what's referred to as a manual. And these are kind of quite generic, but specific to your system as well, aligned to your system and the clauses of the standard. And then the more specific ones are, are, are the processes and procedures that are exactly aligned to how you operate as a business. And they're not looking at how someone else operate something, how someone else's emergency protocols work. It's how your emergency protocols work. There's no reason why you cannot use templates and other free resources. For example, some you'll get on our website, but they have to be modified and adjusted to your specific business requirements. So there are, as I said at the beginning, there are a number of minimum requirements that must be put in place as part of meeting the necessary requirements of 14001. And there are a number of significant management requirements that must be demonstrated in terms of the maintenance of the records and the audit process. And there are a number of requirements associated to operational procedures, depending upon the operations that you work in. So you must have, you know, management of your waste, you must have uh, spill control measures, you must have contamination of ground assessments, 
if those are specific to the business operations that you undertake. We must remember always to review our documentation as well. Going back years ago, when I first got involved in this type of work, it was quite a common practice that organisations would put a management system of some sort in place or an operational procedure or a emergency response procedure in place. And these things would sit in a location in folders and very rarely be looked at. It's important that we understand that we have to review and improve this documentation if we're going to have a true living and breathing management system to comply with environmental requirements. I'd like to take this chance just to thank you for uh, looking and listening to our introduction to environmental management with ISO 14001. I'd like to just ask again if you would uh, subscribe to our FQM Limited YouTube channel and follow us on LinkedIn. Thanks very much for your time.